Hello architects and welcome back to another video on building event driven systems. In this video today, you're going to learn about some of the benefits of non-blocking asynchronous communication. One of the kind of fundamental parts of a message driven system, why you might want to drop event driven architecture. And let's first talk about why non-blocking asynchronous communication can be so valuable. If you think about your typical application where you have blocking communication, whether that be a monolithic application, and inside your typical monolithic application, you will have multiple modules or multiple pieces of functionality. And these pieces of functionality will all be calling each other. That's just a method call inside a monolithic application. Or if you have a more microservices architecture, if you're all about the buzzwords, these microservices are also typically gonna call each other using request response or HTTP type communication. And what will happen in both of these cases is that if this module here or this microservice here wants to make a call to that other method or down that HTTP request, this bit here is going to sit and wait. It's going to be blocking communication, which means if the request had come in here originally, this request is also waiting for that request to complete. And then if this microservice also needs to call this microservice, this request up here is still waiting. Now this causes you some problems when you come to error handling, because if for some reason this service is offline or a, a feature has been pushed out and that module in your monolith is not working correctly, that is then going to come all the way back up the chain and actually affect this original request. That is something that you can handle. Of course you can when you're building microservices or you're building modular systems, but it's something you do need to handle. This is what's known as runtime coupling. At runtime, all of these things need to exist. They need to be there. And there's lots of different types of coupling that you will encounter. Runtime is one of the most common. Things need to be in the right place at runtime. You've got temporal coupling and location coupling. Location coupling is where two microservices are talking to each other. Well, they need to know the location of each other, DNS names, IP addresses. And then you've also got other kinds of coupling, things like data format and semantic coupling. The format of the API request are the variables of a method call that your application needs to bake. These are all data format and more semantic type coupling. And some of these things are loose, more loosely coupled than others. They're easier to work with. Error handling when you have runtime location coupling is quite tricky because you're communicating over a network and networks are hard. Uh, over 70% of you watching this video aren't yet subscribed to this channel and it would mean the absolute world to me if you were to like and subscribe. One of the reasons I do what I do is to produce content that matters to all of you sat in front of your laptops or phones listening to this. And one of the ways I get feedback on if you're enjoying it is the likes, the comments and the subscribes. So I'd really, really appreciate it. If you hit that like button, hit that notification bell, add a comment, I'd love to hear from you. Back to the video. The other thing that this kind of synchronous blocking communication can give you, one of the challenges you can face, is around the lines of dependency. So if you imagine your typical application, regardless if this is a monolithic or a microservices application, and imagine you've got some functionality for processing orders, and you've got some more functionality for managing loyalty points, for example. Now, in your typical synchronous blocking-based communication, an order will come into your order processing service. All the work will be done in the order processing to actually confirm that order, process the order. And once it's completed, the order processing service will say to the loyalty point service, can you please add some loyalty points? This order is completed for our customer, one, two, three, four, can you please add some loyalty points? And the loyalty point service will say, yep, of course I can, thank you very much. And this brings about an interesting question. Should the order processing service actually care about the fact that the loyalty point service exists, even if this is a modular application, a modular monolith. Does it matter? Is that line of responsibility correct? And I would argue it isn't. It isn't the order processing service's responsibility to tell the loyalty point service to add loyalty points. The loyalty point service should be reacting to the fact that an order has been confirmed. 
And this is one of the things that event-driven systems can give you, adopting more message-driven systems. An idea I took from one of Martin Fowler's talks on this topic is that event-driven systems and message-driven systems at their core are about reversing these lines of dependency. So if you come back to the same example again, you've got your order processing service, same again, and you've got your loyalty point service. Yes, these boxes are extremely scruffy. I realize that. And as opposed to your order processing service needing to tell the loyalty point service to add the loyalty points, instead, the loyalty point service is just listening for events that the order processing service is publishing. So the order processing service will say, yep, this order is being confirmed. And the loyalty point service will say, thank you very much. I've received the fact that this order has been confirmed. Let's add some loyalty points to customer one, two, three, four, because that who's that's who that event is for. So it reverses these lines of dependency. And in my opinion, it makes them much more logical. Now you're in a place where things are reacting to events. And when you think about things, how things work in the real world, the business language that you use, if I was talking about this functionality, I would say something like, when an order is confirmed, that should add 10 loyalty points to the customer's loyalty points account. It's not that when an order is confirmed, the order should tell the loyalty point people to actually create the order. That's not how that works. So it's a much more logical human-friendly way of communication, as well as being technically more decoupled. Now, at its core, an event-driven system is made up of three different parts. You've got a producer of some kind, and then you've got the consumer. We've just seen that with the order service and the loyalty point service. And then in the middle here, you will have some kind of message broker. That might be an event bus, that might also be a queue or a stream or a topic. But these are the three key components you will see in any event-driven system. And again, if you think about that logical flow of data, the producer is going to publish a message onto the broker and the consumer is going to subscribe to messages of a certain type that come into that broker. So the order confirmed event gets passed into the broker and the loyalty point service can say, okay, I'm interested when an order confirmed event happens. And then you can also get into interesting places where you can add additional consumers. So there might be another consumer up here, let's call that consumer B, who is also interested in that order confirmed event and they can also subscribe to the bus. So the producer publishes the message once and then each of these two services that are interested receive their own independent versions of that event. In terms of responsibilities now in an event-driven system, you do have some responsibilities at either side. As a producer, you're responsible for producing the message. Logically, if you don't produce the message, then no downstream systems can actually do anything. And you're also responsible for ensuring that the event you produce is consistent and that it meets a specific schema. That's a nice, simple thing to understand that you need to do, right? You need to produce events and produce events in the same way every time. If you were to publish an order confirmed event and every time you published it, you kind of mixed it up a little bit and produced something slightly different, that's not going to be so useful for people consuming that event. Where things get really interesting though, when you compare this to HTTP-based communication. So if you imagine this same relationship, but with a more request response, synchronous HTTP communication, the producer would make the call to the consumer and the producer needs to care about the schema of that API. It needs to care about the rate limits. How many messages per second can this API receive? It needs to know about the location of that API. As a caller, you need to care about all of these things. In an event-driven system, that responsibility shifts to the consumer. So now as a consumer, you're responsible for managing the schema of the events that you receive. You can receive an event and you can control transforming that event into something that your system understands. And remember, as the producers in your system are all going to be really nice and going to produce events in a consistent way, hopefully, if they've watched this video and if they haven't sent them to this video, of course. You're also in control of the rate of events coming into your system because although producers can publish lots and lots and lots and lots of events onto the bus, you can control how quickly you receive them as opposed to a caller just making lots and lots and lots and lots of API requests and suddenly your service falls over because it can't handle the requests. And finally, the location, 
becomes largely irrelevant. Neither of these two services need to know where each other are. All they need to know is the location of the broker, the central broker. And when you're thinking about this controlling the, the rate, controlling the rate of events that are coming into your system, this is one place you can be really careful. So imagine you are the consumer here and you're subscribing to events from a bus over here. And you've got your producing system that is just firing messages onto the bus. Now, the first thing you could do is to subscribe your consumer directly to the bus. What this means, though, is that as the producer publishes events, and it might just publish one event, and then you receive one event, and then it publishes another event, and you receive another event, and this producer might be really nice in that it produces things in a really consistent way. And then all of a sudden, the producer publishes lots and lots and lots and lots of events. And of course, if your consuming application is subscribed directly to the bus, all of these events are suddenly going to hit your system, and this isn't really any different from using API-based communication. The load of your service in this scenario is being defined by something that's outside of your control, and you want to take that control back. So what you can do in this scenario is that you can introduce a really, really lightweight queuing layer. So instead of subscribing your consumer, your business logic, your application code directly to the broker, instead pop some kind of queue in the middle. And this is a queue that's within the boundaries of your service. This is a queue that you control as opposed to the bus, which is just some centrally shared resource that everyone can access and everyone can publish messages. So now instead of that subscription going directly to the bus, the subscription is for the queue. So as this big influx of events comes in, all this big influx of events just build up in the queue. And then your consuming application can read off that queue at a pace that suits it. You've got back control at the boundary of your system, at the edges where you're integrating with a service outside of your control, you want to control the load that hits your system. And this is a really neat pattern for doing that. So instead of subscribing your consumer directly to the bus, pop something durable in the middle. And this is an example of the inbox pattern, the opposite to the outbox pattern, which we'll probably talk about in a later video. You've got an inbox for your service. That inbox is durable. You can store data there in a persistent way and your application can read from that queue at a pace that suits it. So that's a really, really short video on blocking versus non-blocking communication, the core components that you're going to come across as you build out an event-driven system and how that can help you reduce the coupling, at least the runtime coupling of your system, build in a way that's more resilient and actually, in a lot of cases, more logical. In the next video in this event-driven architecture series, you're going to learn about event-first design. Because when you're building an event-driven system, one of the tightest parts of coupling you have is going to be semantic. The format of the message that you send, the data inside the event, that is where the vast majority of your coupling is. So you're going to learn about how you can actually manage that level of coupling. Because there is an appropriate level of coupling that you need. You're going to need coupling somewhere. And in event-driven systems, that coupling is shifted into the event itself. I'll see you there.